Hello, welcome back to another episode of The Conversation. And you know, I'm always excited about every conversation. And tonight, I have absolutely one of the best, one of my friends, political mentors, and all around great human being, Dr. James Zogby himself. And not his stunt double, but we got the real the man himself here tonight. And what can I say? I mean, Dr. Zogby is uh, the co founder, uh, CEO of the Arab American Institute. He is a businessman and an activist. Uh, Dr. Zogby and I met on the campaign of Senator Bernie Sanders. And Doc, I don't know if you noticed, know but I have been knowing of the Zogby name for a very long time in Cleveland because of your polling. Companies internationally known, but certainly here in Cleveland politics, as I was making my way mm-hmm. uh, through through Cleveland politics, the Zogby name was always prevalent in political circles. I learned a lot from the the, the campaigns. The the two of them, I remember in in 1983, Reverend came to me at an, an Arab American event that I'd organized and said, uh, "I want you to join my campaign." And I said, Reverend. Uh, I've been building this organization for four years. I, I I can't I can't do it. I owe it to my community. He said to me, "You'll do more for your community in the next four months than you've done in the last four years," and uh, and he was right <clears throat> because as I went around the country with him and saw the the response, this is the first presidential campaign to include Arab Americans. It was the first time they felt part of the American body politic. The Democratic Party had not worked with us before then. Um, they were so excited that it energized them, gave birth to the Arab American Institute, which I founded the next year because I realized that we could make a full time effort to organize Arab Americans in politics, building on the experience of the campaigns. And it worked. I mean, look at where we are today. And I was just saying to somebody, we're having a mayoral election in Dearborn, and the guy who's in the lead right now is an Arab American, Abdullah Hamoud. In the first year we founded the institute, we had 700 registered voters, Arab American voters in Dearborn. The guy running for mayor ran on the platform of what to do about the Arab problem. And today we've got tens of thousands of registered voters. They've all become registered. Majority of the city council is Arab American, the police chief is Arab American, the state rep is Arab American. Um, and the guy who's going to run, I think, going to win for mayor is Arab American, and that all grew out of the Jesse Jackson uh, experience. And so I did learn a lot, and I learned to stick with it. You know, there were times when I felt so beaten. Yeah. Um, you know, the, there was a at one point the Jewish community went to Reverend and said, "If you keep him on the campaign, um, you're not going to get our support." And I, I said. I said, Reverend, what are you going to do? And he said, I told him you're on the campaign and I'm not walking away from you. You're my guy. And I I was pleased, but I said, you know, I don't like I don't like doing this anymore. I want to quit. And he said, do not quit. If you quit, you give them what they want. What they fear most is that you stick around and fight. And that kind of of sense of weathering adversity, um, I learned from him Um, and it was, it was a great experience. Yeah, I mean, and you talk about Reverend all the time and just the lessons that you learn. And, and speaking about the Institute, it was something in the theory of change that, you know, I, I want to read this verbatim because it really touched me. And it's, and, and, and I want to make sure that everybody knows how to get involved and how to contact you, Doc. But in the theory of change, so, you know, the organization has a mission statement, but your theory of change, our democracy is strongest when communities are empowered and engaged. Empowered communities uh-huh. empower communities. We believe to bring about meaningful change towards the democratic ideas of uh-huh. equality. Justice and inclusion. All communities must be engaged fully in civic life. But the the major point for me: empower communities, empower communities, mm-hmm. and that really is what the Arab American Institute was all about. But spreading mm-hmm. out and creating coalitions, and that is what you do so well. Is that coalition building instinct? Did you always have that, or was it refined or perfected? So to I, speak? I, I grew up. 
I grew up in the civil rights movement uh, in Philadelphia, and then in the anti-war movement in Philadelphia. And um, and I came late to Arab American politics. You know, it's like I, I grew up in one of those ethnic neighborhoods where it really wasn't an issue what you were, right? Until I got to graduate school at Temple, and all of a sudden I was the Arab. Um, it was, you know, why are they letting the Arab guy speak? Or, you know, I got death threats from a group, the Jewish Defense League. And, um, um, and I, I realized that um, what I'd learned from the civil rights movement and the anti war movement, I had to bring my community to that, right? That, that we were strongest when we were in alliance with those who shared our concerns and values. Um, but I learned that in order for us, to be in coalition, we had to be empowered ourselves, right? I mean, in other words, we couldn't be, I founded the Palestine Human Rights Campaign in the 70s and everybody was engaged. The Lutherans, the Methodists, the members of the black church, all of Martin Luther King's, you know, Joe Lowry, Walter Fauntroy, Wyatt T. Walker, all these guys were involved, right? Reverend was involved. All the major anti-war movement guys were involved. Dave Dellinger, Pete Seeger, a Don Luce, people like that. The Arab American community was not organized enough to be a part of it. And so I said, we need to organize, if we're gonna want others to support us, we've gotta be in a position to support them back, right? So, yeah. and the Jackson campaign for me was an, a, a, an embodiment of that. If we got organized and empowered, we could work with members of the black community to help elect Jesse Jackson. Um, we had to bring something to the table, and if you brought something to the table, you sat down and could eat with everybody else. So there was a there was a, a, a synergy there that had to develop. Um, and I, I instinct, I don't know justice, I don't know, or just it was the right way to do it, right? <laughs> Can't do it any other way. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yes, it's really a beautiful thing. And when you were saying, when Reverend said, that, you know, if you quit now, that's that's what they want. Don't don't quit. And the fact that even, I mean, that was really radical what Reverend Jesse Jackson did in the in the 80s uh, for mm -hmm. him to take that kind of position. And it just reminded me of something that Dr. Cornell West says often on the trail in talking about the rights. People's rights, especially Palestinian rights, the rights of downtrodden people all over the world, including this country, which is nobody, people, other people can't tell us who to love. Mm -hmm. And that has really just stuck with me. And it's something that, you know, I certainly took to heart uh, during my campaign. And I want to thank you so very mm. much for being mm -hmm. right there by my side and the community being right there by my side. It was arduous, but. I stood up and I did the right thing and to do it all over again, knowing the threats that I received over believing in justice and security mm -hmm. for, for both peoples. I would absolutely do it again, but you have been instrumental, Doc, in paying it forward, so to speak. You know, the lessons that you learned from Reverend and the lessons that you learned probably from so many other people, especially your dear beloved, your, mm. your the love of your life. Um, it, it really it, it, it rains through in you, mm -hmm. and um, you you are such a blessing to so many people. <laughs> Thank you. You spoke about my my Eileen for a moment. Um, yeah. I when she met me at seventeen, I was a mess. I mean, I I, I was not the person I am today. I, I I wrote when she passed away that she she tempered my speech and my soul. She would. She would come to my speeches because I've been speaking, as they used to say in my neighborhood, let Zagri talk, the kid talks good. Um, and I, I, I would be a little on the extreme side sometimes, 17, 18, 19, then 21, 22. Um, she'd come to the speeches and she'd sit there. I always said I used to speak to an audience of one. Um, I was watching her the whole time. and. And she'd go like this, like that. She'd wince, and at the end of the speech, it'd be like a twelve wince or a ten wince. Or a, <laughs> I remember I, I did a speech for Bernie while she was in the hospital. It was the only one I did during that that second campaign. Yeah. Uh, it was no, it was one one of the ones I did. I did one before she had her stroke. Um, but I went 
to it and because she said you gotta go because it was a, an event honoring Reverend Jackson on Martin Luther King Day. And she said, this is like your life capsulized, you know, you gotta be there. So I went down and I gave the speech, I came, I brought it back to her and I showed it to her and she said, it's no winces. <laughs> uh, so I mean, I I I I came I came a ways uh, in terms of, you know, with youthful radicalism, you, you you tend to be a little more edgy in things you say. But being edgy might make you feel good, but it doesn't help the people you want to convert. Nor does it help the people you want to support, because to the extent to which you say things that make other people wince. It turns them off from the message you're trying to convey, right? And and I had a tough a tough message to sell. I mean, I was talking about Palestinians, about living in the camps, about the the experience of, of having been expelled from your home and wanting justice. And and if I couldn't convey that with a sense of compassion and humanity and make people feel that, then I wasn't doing justice. I wasn't being responsible to the people I was advocating for. And so Having her help me temper my language uh, was so important, um, and uh, you know I, I grew. I mean, we all grow, but uh, um, I am what I am today because of her. Well, I know she was uh, your love, and uh, I, you talk about her all the time, and she's just mm-hmm. such a such a blessing. I. I think about you saying you weren't the perfect 17 year old. What 17 year old is perfect? <laughs> I got a couple of grandsons right now. <laughs> I'm figuring. And it's funny because I go, I go, I go with see my son or whatever, and I see the kids, and I I I come back feeling like, oh my God, what I put my mother through. I mean, it it's like, you know, I watch them interact with each other. I call my brother and I say, I'm so sorry for what I did to you. And he said, What? I said, I was just with my, you know, grandsons and I <laughs> and I said, with the way the older one treats the younger one is what I did to you. I mean, you know, we, we, I think we, we, it's a blessing to live long enough to see your, your, your grandkids um, do the things you did and give the, the parents, your children, the same hard time that they gave you. But then you also end up feeling guilty, feeling guilty about the hard time you gave your mom. Um, it's, it, it's a circle, it's a circle of life and it's, um, at this age, I'm beginning to experience a lot of that. Yeah, you're in a very reflective moment in your life. So speaking of empowered communities, empower communities, let's talk about Pope Francis. He mm-hmm. has been really out there and he has been talking about, uh, quote, you know, being a pest for the poor. <laughs> I love that line. I love yeah. that line. I know he's one of your favorite people. You share articles with yeah. me all the time. What is important as you see it about Pope Francis stepping in to this gulf? Because in many ways it is a gulf mm-hmm. because we need more spiritual leaders and political leaders. I think, you know, I'm a woman of faith, you're a man of faith. We don't try to bludgeon people with our faith, but we are believers. And to have Pope Francis say, you know, I, I'm gonna be a pest for the poor. Uh, what does that mean for us in this moment, both nationally and internationally? Because he also is calling on the pharmaceutical companies and also the wealthiest nations of the world to stop hoarding the vaccine. Mm-hmm. I mean, I read that speech, and and um, it, it is available on the Vatican website in English, and it's it's absolutely worth reading. Not as the Pope, but as a person looking clearly with a clear set of eyes. And what's happening in the world today, and what is keeping us from where we need to be? Um, more people die of hunger than have died from COVID, and yet we don't talk about hunger. Um, we, he said at one point in the speech, he said, um, "You know, we we're not going to come out of this the same. We're not going to come out of COVID the same." And look at what it's doing to our kids. And I said, I started, started reading the speech. Like, what's he talking about? And he talks about the, the 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 social anxiety resulting from excessive use of, of of social media, which he said can be a great communication tool, but also can become isolating for kids. Yeah, um, and drags them down a rabbit hole where they don't need to be in this very delicate period of our of our history. I mean, there's so much in here that is so thoughtful, so provocative, 
that it is actually it ought to be required reading. And I and I thought about it because you know the 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 church that he heads. I mean, the, number one, I'm Catholic, right? But there's very little. Very little uh, uh, that can be matched up between what he says and the church as it currently operates, right? I mean, this is this is the gospel of Matthew. This is the Sermon on the Mount. This is a challenge, not just on the pharmaceutical companies, the defense industries, the food industry, the, the media companies that spread disinformation and create controversy for its own sake, etc. I mean, it's an amazing indictment of everything that's wrong. And the church itself is wrong, and he knows that and he speaks about that. And I thought about it and I remembered Ron Brown. This is gonna be a weird parallel, but when Ron Brown became Secretary of Commerce, he was driving to work one day, and the first day, and he met me, he asked me to come over and see him. And he said, I'm driving to work today. And they say, Commerce Department come out with statistics on whatever. He said, I didn't know we did that. He said, so I decided that my my mission as Commerce Secretary would not be to try to manage the whole department, but to create a vision for the department of trade and commerce as a social leavening, and you know, to create jobs, to create well-being for people in countries around the world, and partnerships between Americans and others. And and the Pope is doing that, right? It's it's like he cannot by himself change the culture of the church, but he can use his pulpit to challenge the culture of the world. And I find that Catholics appreciate him to be sure, but I find Baptists appreciate him, Muslims appreciate him, Hindus appreciate him. There's a message here that is universal and he's and he's doing it. And like I said, the speech is just, I love that pester for the poor. Yeah. He keeps talking about, I'm gonna annoy you one more time by reminding you because prophets annoy people. Yeah. You know, they they remind us of unpleasant truths that we have to face. That's um, right. We need, we need more of that. We need more pests for the poor. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I thank you for shining a light on this because this is an extraordinary man who talks about in his speech. He talks about ecocide and genocide. We're killing the planet and we're killing our people and we're paying no heed to what we need to do to stop both. That's right, and there will be one way or, or another a day of reckoning, so to speak. And that's really what the Pope is yes. reminding us of, and that we do have the power uh, to to do something different. We don't. Mm-hmm. This doesn't have to be the reality mm-hmm. moving forward. To me, it sums up in the Golden Rule when you talk about Matthew, mm-hmm. the, just the Golden Rule: do unto others mm-hmm. as you would have them do unto you. I mean, that's really what the Pope is talking about. And I'm so glad that I he love there's one line he had in there that I, I thought of you right in the beginning. Um, he it's a speech he's giving to leaders of social movements around the around the globe, and he calls them um, social poets. He said poets for justice, because poets he said create images and create realities for us, and you social movement leaders are social poets. You are creating realities. And you're dreaming of an alternative to what is to make us better and leading us toward it. I love that imagery. I love that imagery. And it reminds me, like I said, of you and the the poetry that you speak about and the vision you speak about and how you energize people to go in that alternative direction. It's not, he called Dr. One Point about the egoism of the strong and the conformism of the weak. Social poets are neither egotistical nor are they conformist. They yeah. dream alternative dreams and they inspire us to work toward them. Yeah, I'm just gonna say amen to all of that. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, that we, we're gonna have to do this again. So let me ask you this: what keeps you up at night? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> Everything keeps me up at night. Um, I, melatonin puts me to sleep, but, but, but you know, here's the thing: I, I'm not an ancient man, but I'm old enough um, to have seen real change, and and I believe we're better off than we were ten years ago, and I believe we're getting better every day. Um, we see more evil in the world because we see more, but we're not more evil. We have a generation of people, he talks about the Floyd George movement. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I was so inspired when I read him talking about that. He said, that's the good, that whole movement was the Good Samaritan. They saw injustice. They were not willing to let that injustice happen. They're the ones who took to the streets and said, we will rescue this brother. We will rescue this nation from this evil of racism and police violence. That's that's something that never happened in our history before. That kind of spontaneous social movement of young white people saying this is wrong. It's it got to stop. Yeah, I mean, we're think about the evil is here, the good is here, the good far outweighs the evil, and I think we're getting stronger all the time. And that's what keeps me moving. Does it keep me up? No, I mean, I think about it a lot, but I, I get to sleep because I know the next day is gonna be a full day of work. Yeah, And well, that's what I live for. Well, I wanna thank you, Dr. Zogby, for joining us on the conversation. I am definitely gonna have to have you uh, come back. Appreciate all of your work and what you do, the strength that you have, the vision that you have, the courage that you have, and most importantly, the love that you have for all people. Definitely, definitely shine Thank you. through a strong Thank legacy, you. Dr. Thank you. Thanks, Dina. If people want to find out more about your work, more about the Institute, and just to reach you on social media, where should they go? Well, to reach me on social media, the, my, my Twitter address is at, at JJZ1600, JJZ1600. The office is, um, is at AAIUSA. Uh, my website, where my columns are, is is uh, jameszogby dot uh, com. Please, everyone, take the opportunity to reach out to Dr. Zogby. You are wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Young Turks. Really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR, so those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.